Show of hands again, how many of you know the concept of the millennial kingdom? Okay, so quite a few of us. Wonderful. So this evening, what I'm hoping to do is to give us a crash course. This is not some kind of exhaustive nine-week class where we all become experts in this particular subject. But I do want to give us a crash course in the Millennial Kingdom because it is a very important topic of the Bible. In fact, as you know, in the Gospels, when Jesus says, you should pray like this, one of the things he says is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Something I hope that you'll see this evening through our time together, is that we're waiting on the coming kingdom. And we have descriptions of this coming kingdom. And the descriptions are there to get us excited. The descriptions are there because we're going to be living there if you are a believer in the king. We're going to talk about, you know, why study it. We've already dove into that a little bit. Two popular views, because not everyone's in agreement on this issue. Unfulfilled promises, a timeline. Where's the millennial kingdom? The length of the millennial kingdom, life and culture, how do we enter it, and so forth. And then, of course, the impact for today. So, why study the millennial kingdom? Well, Dr. Michael Vlock, in his work, says the millennium is not some incidental doctrine that doesn't really matter. It's a major part of the Bible storyline. It involves the nature and the timing of Jesus' kingdom. As you read through the Gospels, the kingdom is brought up over and over again. The idea of this future earthly kingdom is not something dropped from the sky. In Revelation 20, it has its roots back in Genesis chapter 1. Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says every writing prophet, with the exception of Jonah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Malachi, all had something to say about the millennial kingdom. Seems pretty important. Acts 1, 6, and 7, you find the disciples talking to Jesus. What was their question? Is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? What they're asking there is, Lord, now that you're here, are you going to usher in the kingdom right now? The kingdom that our prophets talked about? The kingdom we read about? And what was Jesus' response to them? He simply said, it's not for you to know to the times or the periods. In other words, Jesus didn't say, that's a stupid question. I'm done with the kingdom idea. I've moved on. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't rebuff them. He simply said, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that my Father has set. And indeed, this evening, we're not going to be trying to proclaim to you some kind of a date when we can see the kingdom. If you've been to the last few years of this conference, you know that we don't base our Bible reading on headlines. We base it on the text of the Bible. Now, two major or primary views of the millennial kingdom. Of course, there are a range of views on these subjects, but there are two primary views that we should be aware of when we talk about the millennial kingdom. First, the premillennial view. Okay, now let's not get confused here. I'm not talking about the rapture event. So that's a pre tribulation position, oftentimes referred to. This is about the millennial reign of Jesus, premillennial. The pre means he comes back and then establishes his kingdom. Pre-millennial. And it is the idea that a future, literal, in other words, it's an actual kingdom. It's physical. You can see it, feel it, smell it. You'll walk in it. 1,000 year reign of the Messiah on earth is coming. And it comes after Jesus returns to earth. He sets his feet on the Mount of Olives. He does battle against Israel's enemies. And he establishes his kingdom. That lasts for 1,000 years. And then you usher into what's called eternity future. 
Okay? That's the premillennial view. Now, opposed to that is the amillennial view. The prefix a simply means none or no. In other words, there's no kingdom to look forward to in this view. Instead, chapters like Revelation chapter 20, where Satan is being bound in Revelation 20, he's being bound right now, and there's a spiritual kingdom in our midst that you can't see, touch, or feel. And there is no future earthly reign of the Son of David on a throne from Jerusalem. Rather, Jesus is reigning now through the church. Jesus is reigning through the hearts of believers. That's the position of amillennialism. And this position, uh, historicists believe, really started and, and took on full force in about the 5th century AD. And the majority of the Western church holds this position. So what I want to do, let's, let's keep comparing them, but we're going to take a look at the scriptures and you can decide for yourself. Here is a side-by-side -side view. When we talk about the Messiah's reign, premillennial says there's a future reign of the Messiah on earth. Amillennialism says Messiah reigns now in our hearts through believers. The future believers reign. Premillennialism says there is a future reign with the Messiah for all believers. You've been made a kingdom of priests and you'll reign in, next to the Messiah. Amillennial says there's a current reign with the Messiah. Tribulation period, a yet future period according to the premillennial position. The amillennial position says that we're experiencing the tribulation period every time that Christians are persecuted right now. And the book of Revelation is largely historical in nature, not future. The millennium period is a yet future period. Amillennialism says, no, we're in the millennium right now. So as you can see, we're in the tribulation and the millennium at the same time, concurrently in the amillennial position. And the church age, both agree, we're in the church age. Now, for, I don't know about you, but I like to see things in not only chart form, but graph form as well, in like a timeline. So here's a timeline of the premillennial position. Right now, we're in that church age. The book of Acts tells us that the church was birthed, the church was launched after the ascension of Jesus, okay? The earliest believers started to compose the church. Here we are about 2,000 years later. We're still in the church age. The next event on the prophetic calendar would be perhaps the rapture of the church, the catching up of the church, and then the tribulation period, the second coming, the ushering in of the Messiah's kingdom, and then the eternal state. You can see this timeline is very linear in nature. One thing happens after the other, okay? It's important to know that because here's the timeline for the amillennial position. We're currently in the tribulation period. We're currently in the church age. We're currently in the millennial kingdom. They all consummate, they all end at the second coming of the Messiah, and we enter into the eternal state. So you can see there's a difference here in views. What we want to do is say, okay, the kingdom is a very important topic. We know that our brothers and sisters who might hold a different position from us are wonderful people, uh, wonderful brothers and sisters. Everybody's after the word of God and everybody's following the Lord, but both positions can't be right. So we want to look at the scriptures. I am going to presenting, uh, be presenting to you this evening the premillennial position, and that's the position that every speaker has that's up here this weekend. So, sometimes things can be confusing because it gets confused because we know that God is reigning now, right? And God has this universal kingdom. I mean, God is sovereign. He's causing the planets to be in alignment and the sun to shine. If he stops holding the universe together, we're done for. But that's God's universal kingdom. It's God's eternal, heavenly rule, which is always ongoing, no matter what's happening here on earth. It is always in existence, according to Psalm 93. It's comprehensive, unlimited, absolute, and always under God's direct rule. So let's not confuse that with God's messianic kingdom, 
which is this 1,000-year period where the son of David is reigning on a throne in Jerusalem, fulfilling the Davidic promises. That's located on earth, and it's temporal. We're given a length in scriptures, which we'll study. As we examine the Bible, what I think we'll see is that there must be a future, literal, 1,000-year reign of the Messiah on earth after he comes, but before eternity future. Okay? Are you ready to dive in? First, Ezekiel chapter 36. Number one reason why we're going to have a millennial kingdom is because there are physical and spiritual promises to the nation of Israel that remain unfulfilled. And there must be a time in the future when these are fulfilled or the character of God is at stake. Because he has made certain promises, Genesis chapter 15, with the Abrahamic covenant and others, that aren't fulfilled yet. It says in Ezekiel 36, the nations will know that I am Yahweh, the declaration of the Lord God, when I demonstrate my holiness through you, Israel, in their sight. For I'll take you from the nations and gather you from the countries and will bring you into your own land. I'll sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Okay, this is very New Covenant, New Testament language because that's part of the New Covenant promises. The restoration of Israel is promised in multiple prophets. And there must come a time when the physical borders of Israel are established, according to the scriptures, and where the Jewish people are all in a right relationship with God. Are we there today? No. Therefore, it is yet to come because God is faithful. Matthew 19, 28, we see that the Messiah will reign upon the earth over Israel. These are Jesus' own words here. Jesus said to them, I assure you, in the Messianic age. So Jesus recognized there was a period called the Messianic age that was coming. What did he say? When the Son of Man, that's himself, sits on his glorious throne. And what's he going to do? You who have followed me, he's speaking to the disciples here, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother, children or fields because of my name will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. A few different observations here about this passage. Number one, Jesus says there's going to be a messianic age. Number two, the son of man is going to sit on a glorious throne in the messianic age. Number three, the disciples are going to have some sort of authoritarian position in this new kingdom under the Messiah, but over who? Over the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, wait a second. If there are 12 tribes of Israel in a future messianic age, Israel must still exist in the future messianic age. In other words, God has not forsaken his promises. He's not forgotten about his promises. They are simply still yet future. And we see Jesus referencing that right here. And good news for everybody else, because everybody else who follows Jesus and forsakes other things, you've got a great reward coming. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10 tells us that believers, that's you, you will reign upon the earth. Isn't that exciting? Look at this. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. And they sang a new song. You're worthy to take the scroll. This is about Jesus here. And open its seals. Jesus is the only one worthy to open the scrolls in Revelation. Because he was slaughtered and he, was re he redeemed people for God by his blood and every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priest to our God and this is future tense, and they will reign upon the earth. What do we see here about the future millennial kingdom? It's on the earth, and there's a future time where believers must reign. Now, do you feel like you're reigning today? I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm in a car wreck every other week. I feel like I, oh, I turn on the news, or I, I read the newspaper, the news headlines every week, and it doesn't seem to me like I'm reigning as a king. And I think as we continue to look at the characteristics here of the kingdom, you'll see 
that the characteristics that are described, if, if the Bible is to make sense to us, then we simply cannot be in the situation that the Bible is describing. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 through 9. It seems here Paul wanted to correct Corinthian confusion. He says to them, Who makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? You have begun to reign as kings without us. Paul is mocking them here. And he says, I wish you did reign so that we could also reign with you. In other words, Paul is telling the Corinthians, you're not reigning yet. Stop acting like you are. He says, I wish you did reign, but we're not yet. But it's coming. Moody Bible Commentary says, Paul's statement gives an indirect indication that the church is not the full-fledged kingdom of God in this age, as many maintain. Believers will rule with Jesus in the future millennial kingdom, but Paul says here they are not ruling right now. You see, the church is an aspect of the kingdom of God. It is not the kingdom of God. There's a difference. Revelation 3.21, the believer's place, or the believer's rule is placed in the future. Revelation 3 says, the victor, those who hold the faith, those who die with faith, I will give him the right to sit with me on my throne. Isn't that an amazing promise for the believer? Just as I also won victory and sat down with my father on his throne. It's placed in the future. It's not saying the believer's sitting with Jesus on his throne now. It's placed in the future. So, those are some reasons why there must be a millennial kingdom. How about the timeline of the millennial kingdom? Well, we already covered this, but I'm bringing it up again so we can see. The millennial kingdom comes because the king returns. The king returns to establish his kingdom. That's what he's going to do. Look at this. Matthew chapter 25, it says, we learn the Messiah must reign after he returns. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne in his glory. Have you ever noticed that before? He returns and then he reigns. We see the same thing in Revelation chapter 19. Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder saying, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Because our Lord God, the Almighty, has begun to reign. Revelation chapter 19 is far into the future. And notice, it's only then that the Messiah begins to reign. He has the right to reign right now. Absolutely, he has the right to reign. But he just hasn't taken his seat on the throne and begun to reign as yet. The Messiah will reign in the last days. Isaiah chapter 2 says, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. All nations will stream to it, and many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He's going to teach us about his ways so that we can walk in his paths, for instruction will go out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. What we're looking at here is a future time when a Messiah is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem and the nations are streaming up to Jerusalem to receive instruction from the king himself. That's not happening today. But it will happen. And if you know Jesus as your Messiah, you will be streaming to Jerusalem along with the rest of us. How about where is the millennial kingdom? We've already hinted at this. You've already been able to see several passages. First, it's on earth with Jerusalem as its capital. Zechariah 14 says, On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem. But Jerusalem's going to be raised up and remain on its site and will dwell in security. This living water that's flowing out of Jerusalem is living water that's going to make the Dead Sea fresh again. And it's going to flow into the Mediterranean Sea. Ezekiel describes it in great detail. Zechariah 14 goes on. Jerusalem is the residence of the king. We learn that all the survivors of the nations that came up against Jerusalem 
will go up year after year to worship the king. We learn that Israel has expanded borders according to Genesis chapter 15. It's interesting, although Isaiah wrote centuries and centuries after Moses wrote Genesis, we have the same borders. On that day, the Lord will thresh grain from the Euphrates River as far as the Wadi of Egypt, and you Israelites will be gathered one by one, and they will worship the Lord at Jerusalem on the holy mountain. The Euphrates River to the Wadi of Egypt, which is likely the Wadi El Arish, is the exact same borders given to Abraham that have yet to be fulfilled. And even if they have been fulfilled, as some propose, although I don't buy it, they haven't been fulfilled, min olam ve'ad olam, the strongest language in Hebrew for forever and ever and ever. Israel's not fulfilling those borders now. Of course, not only is he going to reign in Jerusalem over an expanded Israel, but his reign is over the entire earth. Isaiah 11 says, None will harm or destroy on my entire holy mountain, for the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. What a wonderful time that's going to be. So, we know there must be a millennial kingdom because promises need to be fulfilled. We know the approximate timeline of the millennial kingdom. It's after the king returns. We know the millennial kingdom is set in a restored, renewed, expanded Israel. Now, what's life like in the millennial kingdom? We're given descriptions of that as well. First, natural people in the kingdom will live long lives. Isaiah 65 says, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will no longer be heard in her. In her, a nursing infant will no longer live only a few days, or an adult man not live out his days. Indeed, the youth will die at a hundred years, and the one who misses a hundred years will be cursed. Just point out a quick distinction here. When you get to the end of the book of Revelation, you've read this time and time again. Death is wiped away, right? It says no more death, no more crying. Here, People are still dying at this period, even if it is an extra long life. This must be a different period than what we call eternity future. Now, also note that people are going to build houses. People are going to plant vineyards. So we have construction going on. We have agriculture ongoing. Who's going to get all these people up to Jerusalem? Perhaps there's transportation going. What kind of role will you play in the millennial kingdom? I don't know. It's going to be a harmonious natural world, though. Elsewhere in Isaiah, it says, The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fatling will be together, and a child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, and their young ones will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit, and a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den. You don't do these things today, do you? If you looked out your, your window, you know, you had a farm there, and you saw a wolf next to your lamb, what would you expect was going to happen next? The wolf was going to eat the lamb. Same thing with the leopard and the goat. And surely I would not allow my four-and-a-half-year-old son to put his hand into a snake's den. But in the millennial kingdom... Those things are wiped away, where it doesn't even appear that the lion is eating meat anymore. He goes to eating straw. There's a, a return to Eden. This is why Dr. Michael Vlock, at the beginning of the, the quote I read, said, this has roots going back to Genesis 1, because ultimately God's design and intention was that man and woman would subdue the earth. We would rule over the earth. But we failed in that mission, haven't we? But God restores all things. There's going to be trips to Jerusalem to worship the king. We read this one. Year after year, people are going to go worship the king of hosts, specifically on the Festival of Booths, which is the Jewish holiday of Sukkot. It celebrates God dwelling, tabernacling together with the Israelites. 
And if you don't go up to worship at Sukkot, rain is not going to fall on your nation. That's another interesting aspect I've picked up in the scriptures, is that it appears there continues to be distinct nations in this period of the millennial kingdom. Egypt is even mentioned as a specific nation, saying if Egypt doesn't go up to worship, no rain's going to fall on them. So we have Israel, expanded borders, God's ruling over that from Jerusalem, and yet we still have other nations in place on this earth. Now, this may seem like too obvious of a question, but how long is the millennial kingdom? And where do we get the length from? Well, nowhere in the Hebrew Bible, nowhere in the Old Testament are we given the length of the millennial kingdom. It comes in the New Testament. In fact, 1,000 years is used six times in seven verses in Revelation 20. They came to life and reigned with the Messiah for 1,000 years. This this is 1,000 literal years. Okay, you can read this passage on your own. The, the term 1,000 years is used over and over again. Satan is bound for 1,000 years. After the 1,000 years is, re, is, is over, he's released for a short time. There's no reason not to take 1,000 years as literal. This is probably the main argument of folks who may not hold to this position is, well, it says a thousand, but it doesn't really mean a thousand. So my question for perhaps you, if you happen to hold that position today, or maybe this will um, provide you further information, is this. What about all these other numbers in the book of Revelation? I've never heard somebody say, well, the seven churches are really not seven churches. Or it says 24 elders, but the 24 is just some kind of a spiritual number that means something else. Or there's not really seven trumpets or two witnesses. It's not two witnesses. It's, you, see, you, see, you catch my drift here? Why take thousand as being spiritual in nature if we're taking all the other numbers as literal? It seems to me inconsistent at the best. So... What have we learned? There will be a literal future kingdom of the Messiah. That kingdom of the Messiah will be on earth. The capital will be Jerusalem. The king, Jesus the Messiah, resides in the capital. The world's going to be a harmonious place, but not perfect. Israel will be restored physically to her land and spiritually to her Lord. This is why Paul could write in Romans chapter 11, one day all Israel will be saved. This is when it happens, when the king returns. And believers will reign with the Messiah. Again, exactly what that looks like and the nature of it, we're going to find out. Now, you might be wondering, how do you purchase a ticket to the millennial kingdom? You know, here you got online probably and you registered for this event or you signed up here at Village Church and you purchased yourself a spot right here. Those in the front row paid, what, three, four hundred dollars? <laughs> so how do you purchase a ticket to the Millennial Kingdom? Here's the good thing. It's already been purchased for you. Someone has already bought it for you. They paid the price. All you have to do is show up at will call and grab your ticket. And how do you do that? You place your faith in the king who's going to bring the kingdom. Because he paid the price. 2 Corinthians 5 says, God made the one who did not know sin, that's Jesus who lived a perfect life, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When we believe in Jesus, our sins are washed away. Romans 10 tells us if we we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, he's the king, and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. If you do that, you've got yourself a ticket. 
So for those of us who already believe in Jesus, what impact does the millennial kingdom have on us today? Well, James 4 says, you too, speaking to believers, be patient, strengthen your hearts. Um, I like how the Amplified Bible says it. Keep them energized and firmly committed to God, for the coming of the Lord is near. We are to continually be looking up, awaiting in expectation. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus at any moment. And when we live in that kind of attitude all the time on a daily basis, we're much more likely to be sharing the gospel with our unsaved friends and neighbors. We're much more likely to be down on our knees in prayer. I don't know when the Lord is returning, but I do know we're closer today than we were yesterday. And we don't know how much time we have left, either before we breathe our last or before the Lord decides to return. But time is short. And perhaps you're here this evening and you came to check things out, what this conference is all about, and you don't yet know the king of the coming kingdom. I would invite you this evening to place your faith in the Lord Jesus. He gave his life for the sins of the world because he loves you deeply. He knows you, and it's the absolute best decision that you can ever make. And so if you've not yet made that decision, I invite you to do that this evening.